It's time for From the Short Grass with Trey Schaap, a golf podcast for those who love golf, struggle with golf, and just like to enjoy the outdoors and fellowship with friends, all while chasing a ball around trying to put it in a four and a quarter inch diameter hole. From the Short Grass is brought to you by Stevens Incorporated, an independent financial services firm with the freedom to focus on what matters most. Blackman Auctions. For over 80 years, better auctions have always been Blackman Auctions. Beachwood Pinnacle Hotels. We partner with you to deliver high yield results by managing, developing, and investing in top quality hospitality assets. And now, from the short grass, here is your host, Trey Shap. Welcome to another edition of From the Short Grass. I am your host, Trey Shap. In episode 44, we had Ken Duke on the podcast here. And lo and behold, Ken Duke gets to play a round of golf with former President Donald Trump. What does Mr. Trump do? He makes a hole in one in front of Ken Duke. How about that for karma? You can go to our Twitter page at From Short Grass to find the video of President Trump walking onto the green, picking the ball out of the hole, and then celebrating with the other guys in the group. Some pretty big names in the game of golf playing with Mr. Trump. Coming up on this edition of From the Short Grass, last week I was in San Francisco over spring break, took my daughter out there to watch the Arkansas Razorbacks play in the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight. And I had a chance to sit down with Dan Leibovitz of the Southeastern Conference. Dan loves the game of golf, and he loves the game of basketball. We talk some hoops, but we also talk some golf. And he's got an interesting story about zebras and wildebeest on a golf course here in the United States. Since 1938, better auctions have always been Blackman Auctions. Find them on the web at blackmanauctions.com, one of our great sponsors of From the Short Grass. We're back after this. Stay with us. With all the decisions you need to make about what to do in El Dorado, finding a place to stay is an easy one. The Haywood is uniquely positioned to make your stay one to treasure. Located in the historic Union Square district of El Dorado, the Haywood offers luxurious accommodations that feature contemporary, colorful rooms with high-quality bedding. Comfortable baths with walk-in showers and a spacious workspace with stylish plantation shutters that are unique additions to the stunning decor in a non-smoking environment. Make the Haywood your home away from home the next time you visit El Dorado. This is Thomas Blackman with Blackman Auctions. Me sponsoring a golf show is great irony. I've been a phenomenally bad golfer for 30 years. I don't know the difference between a penalty area and a bunker. I like it, but I'm really bad. You listen to this show and to Trey because he's a great golfer and knows the game backwards and forwards. I know auctions like Trey knows golf. I've been a professional auctioneer for 30 years. I know auctions. Trey knows golf. Listen to the correct expert. Call me to learn about auctions, not Trey. Since 1938, better auctions are Blackman auctions. Strength is measured not by the number of accounts. Strength is placing value on relationships. It's having the vision and the guts to invest in growth. It's the commitment to responsibly manage your money. At Stevens, we believe that our strengths build success. Not only for us, but for our clients. Stevens. Member NYSE SIPC. Welcome back to From the Short Grass. On the tee, Dan Leibovitz. Dan Leibovitz, thanks for joining me on From the Short Grass. We're sitting here in the Marriott Marquis in San Francisco. Kind of ironic that here is where we're doing our golf podcast, and you think about San Francisco and the fine golf courses around here in Northern California. I mean, you've got Pebble, you've got Olympic Club, TPC Harding Park, host of the 2020 PGA. Let's start back with you. When did you first pick up a golf club? Do you remember? Gosh, uh, probably, I was probably eight, nine, or ten years old. My parents played. They were big on the range. They, they said, you don't get to go on the course till you really know what you're doing, and thought that would give me uh, better habits. I don't know how well it worked, but it was a sound Practice. Theory. Yes. Let's go back to your youth. Growing up in Philly, basketball, a big part of your life as it has been for most of your life. Take me to your basketball days. Uh, yeah, so I was, uh, I was at a really good high school program, Episcopal Academy. We had some uh, tremendous players. We had NBA player Jerome Allen uh, played with me. We had uh, a guy by the name of Eugene Burroughs. 
Richmond beat Syracuse in the NCAA tournament. He made the free throws to win the game. So we had, we had some big time guys. I was on some good teams. I was pretty good. If you left me alone, I would make some shots. I was uh, <laughs> if we left you alone. If you left me alone, <laughs> if I didn't have to guard somebody and you left me alone, I was pretty good. Uh, and then I, I had chances to play uh, Division One. I. I was recruited by a lot of Division Ones, high Division Threes. I uh, ended up playing at uh, Franklin and Marshall, transferred to Penn. Uh, was with them for a little bit and ended up not playing and getting in more into coaching, really. So I'm not, I'm not in this role because I was any kind of great players, but I, but I love the game, uh, and I ended up coaching the game for a long time. I think that comes across the fact that you love basketball. I've watched you at some of the places, specifically down in Tampa earlier this year at the SEC basketball tournament. I mean, you study and you're intense. You're into it nonstop. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I look at the game through so many different lenses now. Kind of get lost in different ways of looking at it. Because of my job, I never thought I would do this, but I have to look at it through the officials' lens and evaluating our officials. That's probably what I'm paid to do more than anything else. Then I get into personnel. I have have NBA uh, executives that will call and say, tell me about this guy, tell me about that guy. So I kind of keep it uh, that in mind. And then as a former coach, I'm always looking at, you know, what are they running? Are they switching? Are they staying with their own? Are they hedging? Are they blitzing? I, I, I can't help myself. So I, I kind of, as I watch a game, I just get, I just get into different viewpoints, and I love it. I, I just love it. It's, it's, and I love this time of year. And I love conference tournaments. I mean, if yeah. I, a single elimination basketball is just incredible. I would think there are many algorithms just going through your head at any given moment during a game. Like I said, there's a lot. There, there's there's so many things that I'm looking at, and out of my role, I I, I, I get the uh, the complaints from the coaches when things aren't going well with the officials or, or things that happen in the game. So I'm always looking over, and and I kind of know the the calls that are going to be touchy, and and, and just kind of see the reaction. He's okay. He's moving on, or he's not. So I'm taking it all in. I'm looking all around the building and at everything. I want to take you back to the SEC tournament this year, Arkansas LSU, Will Wade. I mean, he's staring over you and Greg Sankey. I mean, he is – he's looking a hole through you. He was. Uh, I just tried to pretend like I didn't see it. But <laughs> <laughs> he was. Uh, Will had a Will had a, you know, he's a, had a frustrating year. He, he, he had a lot of foul trouble, and uh, you know he didn't score easily. So he was he was always trying to work it. Let's go back to when Greg Sankey gets in touch with you about bringing you to the SEC because he wanted to make basketball better. What was that conversation like? So he hired Mike Trangizi first as a special advisor, and um, Mike. I don't think if it wasn't for Mike, I don't know if I'd be here. Mike was in Providence. I was working at the American Athletic Conference in Providence. Met him for a lunch. I was really nervous about it. As the guy, you know, he's like the godfather of college basketball in some ways. He's selection committee chair and Big East commissioner. And uh, I, I had the greatest lunch with the guy. He's like my Italian grandpa that I never had. And it was so easy, such a good conversation. I think he could really help connect the dots with Greg. Uh, and I felt good about it. When I talked to Greg and, and talking to Mike, I think Mike and I, from an outsider's perspective, were thinking it was a time where they had just gotten three teams in the NCAA tournament in 2016. It wasn't good enough for anybody. And when we first came, there was such a defeated attitude. You know, really, well, the football is so good. I wonder if it affects us. Um, you know, SEC bias. Uh, Kentucky is so good, and we can't get anyone else. And Florida, it, it just... There, we can't get our fans involved till football's over. Just a million excuses, and I mean, us two coming in, we're like, I don't get it. I just don't get it. I'm looking at hundred thousand people at a football game, unbelievable facilities, unbelievable resources, SEC network, hire the right coaches, and this is not rocket science. Uh, so we felt great about it. When you got down to the nuts and bolts and started talking and discussing with the coaches, specifically in the spring meetings in Destin. What were those conversations like behind closed doors, if you could take us into those? Really talking, like all conferences do, we talked about promoting the league and, and, and trying to have a tight-knit group where we you know, we can fight and we can argue in this room over things, but when we're in front of a microphone, let's celebrate each other, let's make sure when the game's over, hats off to uh, the other coach and, and, and 
uh, you know, th- those things matter and, and those things help. And I, I just think that we just kind of needed some some wind in our sails. Mm-hmm. We, we just said, look, this is a, this is going to be a great basketball league. We've got to stop walking around with our, our head in our hands. And this is, we got to have our chest out. We've got great traditions and really that, you know. Are you surprised Texas A&M didn't get in the big dance this year? I am. I am. I, I talked to the selection committee. So I never knew this one until I worked in the conference office. So each conference has two conference monitors from the selection committee. And you have touch points throughout the year, about once a month, where we'll go through every single team and this is what they do well. And I do it like a coach. This is their some of their key analytics. This is their personnel. This is why I think they're a great team. And we do that throughout the year. And, and I'm usually – pretty close on things and pretty pretty close on seeding and i'm also pretty realistic i don't try to oversell if i think somebody's a a three seed i'll tell them they're a three seed i don't say they're a one seed and i just had such the wrong take on a&m because i thought they were squarely on the bubble coming into tampa and really when they beat auburn i thought okay well now now they're good and i I, it just shows that i was way off because they won another game and they were still not the first one out. Right. So it, it's it's the first time since I've been here we had one right in that situation. We've had teams that were clearly in, but I, I just gauged it apparently wrong. And, and it's hard for me as a former coach. We used to have this metric in the, in the selection committee process where selection process where the last 10 was a thing. You know, they, they finished eight and two or six and four and, that was a criteria, and now it's officially not. But I just think that as a coach, I believe with all my heart that you measure a coach on where they are at the end. You don't judge a painting until the artist is finished with the painting. And all coaches go through injuries and losing streaks. I know they had one, but you continue to tell your team, like any sport, just get, like a golf, mm-hmm. you know, get two bogeys, next hole, next you shot, gotta go to next, next putt. Yeah. And they did an incredible job of that, and I couldn't. I couldn't imagine how gratifying it must have felt for Buzz and his staff watching those guys play the way they played. And if you were just dropped out of the sky, I know that people get mad when you say the eye test, but if you just dropped in and watched that tournament, you say, okay, you have a bunch of ranked teams. Is, what's A&M? Are they like 10 or 12? Or like they, they were that good right. as he watched them. Uh, but we look out of our lens at the SEC, and I just – we we had it wrong. I mean, or, or they did. I, I don't want to. I don't try to throw arrows at them, but I do think they should should have been in the tournament. Eric Musselman and the job he's done at Arkansas. Hunter Yurichek brought him in from Nevada. What has he meant to the SEC? He's been great. Uh, one of the things that he does so well is just the marketing. Just the social. I mean, you you don't necessarily have to start there, but you have to talk about it. And you can you can just be a ball coach. You can survive, and you better be really good. But when you embrace the whole state, the whole fan base, the whole country, he knows what he's doing. I mean, his Twitter stuff is, you know, sometimes I, I hear of other people in coaching. Not, I don't hear it from our league, but, God, the guy's like never stops or he's self-promoting, but he's promoting Arkansas is what he's doing. He's getting people to click on Arkansas and talk about Arkansas, and uh, I, I think that's brilliant. Uh, I really do. And and even the way he's been throughout this tournament, embracing Buffalo and now embracing San Francisco and the hats and the shirts, they it, it, it put a lot of time and thought and energy into it, but it, it pays dividends. So that's one. And then as a coach um, and as a recruiter, he's just been phenomenal. He's been he's, – he's, he's, I know he's got a great high school class coming in next year also. Yeah. It's interesting. He's got – he was way ahead of the curve, as everyone knows, way ahead of the curve on transfers – Right, and now he's done well with the portal. Still, but now people are going to transfers, and now he's circling back and and doing well with high school kids. So he's 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 kind of stays ahead of everything, and, and just a really a really good basketball coach. And I said to Hunter before the game, one game, one shot. Eric Musselman, I'll take my chances. I mean, he's gonna he's gonna find the right game plan. Uh, I'm not going to guarantee victory, but he's going to give himself a great chance to win a game. For two years in a row now, Arkansas, the last team standing in SEC basketball in the NCAA tournament. 
it's a tremendous accomplishment. It's uh, two straight elite eights. It, to do that is is big time, and uh, they they should be proud of that. Two years in a row that we had some really good teams. Alabama, notably last year. Uh, Greg and I were talking about that game last night. That was a painful one, but yeah, to be the last one standing is significant, and 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 we needed it. Uh, we had a tough, we had a tough first weekend, and. Uh, kept their mouths shut, and we knew that Arkansas was still there. And, and uh, it, I think it, it helps validate uh, some things that we accomplished this year. I really do. Your time with John Cheney, what was that like? I could talk about it all day. He's, <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he's a brilliant man, and he's uh, a very caring and thoughtful leader. And, the, and I will never call him the greatest coach of all time, but he is one of the greatest teachers. He was a grade school coach he was a high school coach and teacher he was division two uh, national champion uh, and an hbcu the first hbcu and then he was you know, had a great run at temple but people throw things around like father figure and mentor and teacher and they use it when it's convenient but he was that every single day I mean, every day in practice he would sit the team down for 25 30 could be an hour and talk about any it could be politics it could be religion it could be education it could be anything and he would somehow at the end weave it into basketball and I heard the same thing so many times being there 10 years but every time I heard them he still pulled you in because he was he's like a master storyteller and teacher uh, but great to work for not always easy but then you knew he, that he cared about you, and you knew he cared about the players. And the last thing I say is, I, as I said, I could talk forever, but he had an incredible gift, and I think this was partly experience and partly just confidence, and, and he was so sure of himself that he could be, as he would say, the grizzly bear on the floor. So he could. I, I saw him make some guys cry, like <laughs> six ten. 270 pound guy that played in the NBA for a long time I saw him cry on the practice floor and then five minutes later they could be in the office and he was giving them oatmeal cookies and how's your grandma and they loved him again and it's really hard to do that it's hard because as coaches if you're younger and not as wise and not as strong you know and I was a coach when I got mad I might be mad at the kid for three days and you know and 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 just the ability to make sure that everybody knows that that's basketball and that's the floor but i'm still this guy he was a master at it he could he could weave in and out of that so well you're taking on a new role at the sec they're adding women's golf to your title you excited about that I, i'm so excited our season is long it's great but it's a grind sometimes and the ncaa tournament and our tournament in Tampa is kind of a light at the end of the tunnel. And that, and that golf tournament for me, I, I can't wait to be on that tee box. I mean, I, I, we have a, a rules uh, expert, rules official, uh, Jan Barry, who works with the NCA, and she does ours. And so when I talk to her and she talks about what I need, to, you need to be on the tenth tee. Like that's that's what I got to do. <laughs> I just watch these great swings all day. So I got to do that. And there's a lot more than that, but just the calls that I get from coaches in our league in basketball are sometimes impossible I mean, if you if you get a, a coach who's lost three games in a row and they're mad about i, I can't answer their you know I, I can talk to them i can listen but i can't make anything go away and then to get a call from a golf coach during the season and what they're talking about is so great they want to know whether we can you know host an event in hawaii together if you know it's like we could talk about this all day you know it's so refreshing and as long as you get to go as long as i get to go <laughs> so their their problems are such great problems in golf and i've gone to the championship as a fan every year i take one of my boys with me and, and we just ride around and i guess through osmosis i hope that if i watch them swing the way they swing i'll have a better tempo and they're so good they're just so fundamentally it's beautiful to watch to me how is your game? You know, I'm one of those guys that this is the this is what people say. If you played more, you could be good. I think I have a pretty good motion. I think yeah, like I think I, I around the greens, I don't do enough, and that, and that's the that's the playing more. If someone could teach me how to really chip well and be a decent putter, I think I could be all right. I can I can hit the ball, but that's that's been me for all these years. I, coaching conference office that you know people on the outside say oh. 
you know, your coach, he must golf all summer. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> that's what the Hall of Famers do. Like, the guys like me, we don't, we don't get to golf. And, you know, we can't afford to <laughs> go to a country club or belong to one either. Um, but, you know, I, and now I'm trying to a little bit more. I say that every summer and then things come up, but hopefully I'll play more. Who are some of the other coaches that you know play golf that you've played with? Fran Dunphy, who's retired now. He's at Penn and Temple. is a really good golfer. Kelvin Sampson played with Kelvin. He's really good. Yeah. Uh, I want to say lefty. China. Th- those are. Um, I played with them when I was at the American, but I, I know of other guys. I have, I, have, I have some buddies that you wouldn't know that I played with that coach on a lower level. But, yeah, I played with those guys. Kelvin lived on a golf course in, um, God, maybe Oklahoma. And he said every night he would go out with three clubs and he would play the same two cor- two holes and just do a loop, and, and he got really, really good. Your time in Philly growing up, ever get to Marion? I've played Marion. Yeah, the wicker baskets. I've played Marion, yeah. I, I, I played Marion How spring. was that experience? I parred the quarry hole. That was my that was my favorite. And I, and the, and I was pl- the first time I played, I parred like the hardest hole on the front nine, but I was playing terrible. And my buddy was like, you don't understand, like nobody does what you just did. So it's just one of those things. But – it's a little bit of a nerve-wracking place. It's not a relaxed round of golf at all. I don't know if you've ever been there. So the first tee box, it's a very average par four. It's not long. I mean, every bunker in that course is insane, and the, right. the rough Deep. is insane. Right. But like this, this is really just kind of a ho hum tee shot, and you know, a small green, but not impossible. But your tee shot, you're 20 feet from where everybody's sitting and eating. Your first tee shot on the and whole, they're all watching. Oh, you. they're all watching. And it's Marion, so like you, there's no mulligan, um, so that's tight. And then everything, everything is. Uh, I don't know how many places are like this, but don't let them see you take your cell phone out in the parking lot, or change your shoes in the parking lot, or wear a hat indoors. I mean, there, it's a strict place, so it kind of gets you like edgy as soon as you walk right. in. Like you're, whoever's taking you there is giving you the ground rule, like don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So it's that. So you're walking around on pins and oh, needles no the whole question. time. Oh, no question. Then you get that first tee box, um, and, and I've never hit that. It's such an easy drive, and I've never hit that fairway. And the wind blows, and the wicker doesn't move. It's, it, it's so, there's so much character to it. And then you walk around, and the caddies will say, this is the hole where Bobby Jones, this is the hole. And I got that picture right, right oh, at yeah. the spot where Bobby hits that two iron, one iron, two iron. Uh, into the 18th. Um, so it's, it's, it's incredible. A lot of history there. A lot of history. There, there are some great courses. What are some of the best courses you've played, and what is your top course? Oh, my God, i got to think about this. <laughs> it's not like I've played a million great ones. Oh, oh, uh, oh, my God, i got to think of the name of this course. It's the match play course. Oh, oh, Hoopy. Have you ever heard of Hoopy? I've not. Listen, this is the most amazing place on earth. Now i got to Google where it is. Oh, Hoopy? Oh, Hoopy. It's a match play course, okay? Okay. I haven't thought about this in a while. So this like billionaire guy, I'll, I'll, I'll look at. I mean, you got to look it up later. But he he starts this. Um, he, he basically buys up this land, and there's like seventy members of this place. Okay, one of them is Rory McIlroy. By the way, I saw his his lockers are a bunch. It, it, it's very exclusive. It's like pro athletes. Do you're looking it up? Oh, Hoopy Match Club, yes. Cobtown, Georgia. Cobtown, Georgia. Okay, so. It's very quirky who gets in and who doesn't get in. There's, like, CEOs of corporations that are dying to get into this place, and he won't call them back. But yet he'll go play a round of golf with some former NBA player and have a good meal with him. He's like, I want you to join my club. It's, like, completely hit or miss. Okay? But what's amazing about it is only for match play, there are no tee markers. So there's these tee boxes that can be, like, 85, like, literally 80 yards sure. long. yeah. And whoever wins the hole... You can say, I want to play this as a long par four, or okay. I want to move it up and play it short. So everything is just built around competition. It's an incredible golf course. You can play it two different ways. There's, a, there, there, I think it's called the Champions Course is one way, and then there's something called the Whiskey Course where you play the same course, but now you're hitting from this tee box, and this goes across to this green. Like It's kind of like a maze. Wow. And um, they have uh, zebras. And wildebeest on the back nine. You just see they just like imported these. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's not even like a real world. It's 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 phenomenal. I have to look that up. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of like the SEC football coaches have gotten a chance to play there. They were telling me, and we went on this day. It was like some holiday weekend. I can't remember what it was, and it, we were the only ones there. Literally, 
myself and four friends, they opened up the whole club, all the food, everything, and we stay. You, they have these gr- great places to stay. Incredible. You, That's number one. Okay. Uh, hey, I'm going to have to try and do Gotta a get on research there. and get on there. Yeah. You and Greg Sankey, who would win? Golf? Yeah. I'd, I would get him. You would? Yeah, I think so. Well, Greg's like me, too. He's a uh, he's a God. Is Greg a lefty? Greg's a hockey player. He loves he hits loves it a long hockey, way. So he hits it. And if you think I have no time to play, <laughs> he has no time to play. <laughs> he told me that before yeah, when he, he was on. Yeah, he has no time to play. But he he will crush a couple drives, but then his uh, he just doesn't play. Can a you lot. get into his head? No. I, well, he gets into his own head, just like I do. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't talk a lot of trash to Greg, but I think he gets. He's such a. Uh, he's more so than I am, and I am pretty bad. But he's a. He's a perfectionist. He wants to control what he can control. So I think him going to the golf ball and lining it up and getting over that ball and doesn't go where he wants it to go. It just drives, it drives him nuts. Right. Uh, but we play we play a lot this summer. There, there's a uh, Mark Womack was on our staff. Has been there forty yeah. years. He's he's very good. He's very he's very consistent. He's one of those guys like aim at the that tree right there, and his ball goes right at the tree, right down the middle. Doesn't hit it long. So he's not been in the office much. No, he's been working he's on always, his game. Yeah, he he gets out. He gets out and go, he works. But he tenure he can do. He that. could do tenure. Yeah, and the guy named uh, William King is our associate commissioner for legal affairs. Uh, that guy, <laughs> if he could hit a wood off the tee, he he would be in the seventies. Like he's he's incredible uh, approach shots and in, but he he takes out his uh, three wood, and I hold my breath. He wow. holds his breath too. Yeah. It just doesn't go. It doesn't go where he That's wants awesome. to go. That's <laughs> awesome. All right, fantasy foursome. You and three others, living or deceased, who would you want to play around with? Oh my God, that's such a hard question. I got to play with my dad. He's in there. Uh, I think I'd like to play with uh, Freddie Couples. Boom, boom. Yeah. I think I'd like to play with He's Freddie Couples. He's got a Couples. sweet swing. You were talking about sweet yeah, swings that's earlier. why I want him because yeah. I, I think his tempo, I think I'm going to hit better after he hits. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take him and then, uh, oh, my God, that's really hard. I think I'll say, uh, I'll say Tiger. Who doesn't want to play with Tiger and see what that's like? I think it would right? be pretty neat. Like driving par fours and all that. Plus, now it means that Tiger would be fully recovered in my hypothetical dream foursome. So that's exactly. Be yeah. Dan, thanks so much. Thank you. That was fun. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. This is Thomas Blackman of Blackman Auctions. Trey asked me to sponsor a show for another few months. Even though I don't like golf, I do like his show. I have no idea how he gets the awesome variety of guests on his show, but it is entertaining and informative even for a horrible golfer like myself. I'm learning a lot about the game and about the passion for playing. So much so, I've started using my country club for more than Sunday brunch. Trey makes golf interesting. I make auctions interesting. For auctions, listen to me. For golf, listen to Trey. Since 1938, better auctions are Blackman Auctions. With all the decisions you need to make about what to do in El Dorado, finding a place to stay is an easy one. The Haywood is uniquely positioned to make your stay one to treasure. Located in the historic Union Square district of El Dorado, the Haywood offers luxurious accommodations that feature contemporary, colorful rooms with high-quality bedding. Comfortable baths with walk-in showers and a spacious workspace with stylish plantation shutters that are unique additions to the stunning decor in a non-smoking environment. Make the Haywood your home away from home the next time you visit El Dorado. That will do it for this edition of From the Short Grass. I want to thank again Dan Leibovitz from taking some time out of his busy schedule, sitting down with me out there in San Francisco. Also, while I was in California, I had the chance to go check on the Little Rock Trojans men's golf team. They were playing at the Goodwin at the Stanford University Golf Course. Now, the good one is a prestigious tournament. It was a stacked field, and the Trojans finished tied for sixth. The Little Rock Trojans were led by a final round 64 by Marcel Rauch that included an eagle on his final hole of the day. Congratulations, Jake Harrington and Patrick Sullivan, head coach and assistant coach, respectively, of the Little Rock men's golf team. The top 12 teams each year get invited back the next year. So the Little Rock Trojans look to be going back to Palo Alto next spring to play in the Goodwin. 
Due to the length of our time we had with Dan Leibovitz, no rule segment this week. We will bring that back next week with our PGA Master Professional, Adam Carney. I hope your next round on the course is a good one, and it's about time to start getting out there and playing a little bit more. When you find your ball mark on the green, fix it and a couple of more. And I hope to see you sometime soon from the short grass. You've been listening to From the Short Grass, a weekly podcast dedicated to the game of golf. This has been a presentation of the Buzz Radio Network.